While he's been laughably drunk and bombastic throughout the Krakoa era of X-Men, Gabriel Summers, a.k.a. Vulcan's return to the world of X-Men, brings with it a huge mystery that extends from Hickman's X-Men to Immortal Hulk to cosmic fallout from the 2009 Marvel event War of Kings. Today I'll answer, what is the mystery of Vulcan and why does it matter for X-Men? What does this have to do with the death of death and War of Kings? How might this mystery connect to everything from sinister secrets to the Phoenix to the promised December X-Men event? in 2020. Hey, I'm Dave Busing, founder and editor-in-chief of ComicBookHerald.com. If you like the CBH YouTube channel or podcast, please consider liking, subscribing, and sharing. Helps my channel a great deal. Links to CBH channels and content are included in the show notes. You can find full X-Men and comic book reading orders on ComicBookHerald.com. Spoilers for a boatload of recent Marvel comics may follow, as well as the War of King event. In X-Men number 8, 2020, Gabriel Summers, a.k.a. Vulcan, is shown having restless dreams and nightmares about his time floating through space in the fault, in the wake of his battle to the near death with Black Bolt in the Cosmic War of Kings. His hard partying lifestyle would seem to be a coping mechanism. At the same time, Shi'ar battle records from this issue let us know that while presumed dead, Vulcan in fact never died, implying he was not resurrected on Krakoa as previously thought, but instead somehow found his way from War of Kings to House of X. This clear and present mystery got me thinking about why Jonathan Hickman would want to call back to War of Kings, and pretty soon I was falling down an endless theory rabbit hole pertaining to one, Black Bolt's role as one of the Celestial Messiahs, as seen in my video connecting Hickman's FF to the upcoming Empire, and two, how Hickman's X-Men and so much of Marvel right now is on a cosmic crash course with the death of death, with the third Summers brother perhaps at the center of it all. Surprisingly so. If stating Vulcan never died wasn't enough, Hickman and artist Mamad Asrar hammer home the point by mirroring the exact same panel layout used in FF prior to showing Black Bolt's escape from the fault. Shouts here to at Abyssal Odin on Twitter for being the first I've seen to identify these layouts are exactly the same. I thought there were similarities. No, they are mirror images of each other, which is very, very cool. Before digging into what this means, a quick refresher on War of Kings is useful to understand why Vulcan and Black Bolt are simultaneously drifting in the vacuum of a Terran space and time. We get there because Vulcan, having ascended to Emperor of the Shi'ar, following the rise and fall of the Shi'ar Empire storyline written by Ed Brubaker and Uncanny X-Men, is at war with the Kree Imperium, at the time ruled by Black Bolt and the Inhumans. Very, very notably, the Vulcan of this era is a mad king, warped by power and bloodlust after an admittedly traumatic sequence of events detailed in the pages of X-Men Deadly Genesis. In Deadly Genesis, we learn that Vulcan is the long-lost third Summers brother, a secret part of Professor X's history as the group of young mutants originally sent to rescue the OG X-Men from Krakoa before giant Size X-Men number 1 in 1975. With the aid of Darwin, Vulcan does not die, but is instead launched into space on a piece of Krakoa. My head is buzzing from the house-slash-powers connections here until his return to the living after the post-House of M Scarlet Witch's M-Day. All the mutant energy in the world essentially rushed into space and Vulcan captured it. He's an omega-level mutant dealing with energy absorption powers. So again, this all sets Vulcan on a violent collision course with Marvel Cosmic, culminating in a fistfight with Black Bolt. Despite his love of explosions, it's actually Black Bolt's planned Terrigen bombs, an idea Hickman would gravita gravitate to again during New Avengers and Infinity, that creates the fault in space and seemingly leads to the death of these two kings. Of course, we now know the kings did not die. Before detailing his genetic prophecy as the Midnight King and Celestial Messiah, Hickman and artist Greg Tacchini deliver a few pages of Black Bolt's escape, although the specifics are few. My biggest takeaway is that it looks like Black Bolt is fighting a many-angled one, the Cthulhu-like entities that dominate the Cancerverse in the Marvel Universe. Again, though, the escape effectively boils down to uh, Black Bolt's destined to fulfill prophecy and his power set's super dope, so sure, he can escape. It should not come as a shock that there could be more to it. The Cancerverse is the realm that lies at the end of this fault, as discovered by Quasar in Realm of Kings, and most thoroughly explored in the Thanos Imperative. It's an alternate dimension that follows the trajectory of our known Earth-616 until the death of Captain Marvel's story, Marvel's first original graphic novel by Jim Starlin, is reversed. It's a truly deathless universe with undead parallel universe revengers as, as sort of your, um, your doppelgangers of the Avengers and these many angled ones seeking growth into the Marvel Universe's known reality. Speaking of the Cancerverse, and this is where I really start to run off the track, so stay with me here, the concept is very relevant to the current state of X-Men or Mortal Hulk and others. In Valkyrie No. 7, written by Jason Aaron and Al Ewing with art by Kafu, we're introduced to the death of death. 
As Jane Foster tells us, the entity is the living judgment of death as a function of the universe, literally determining whether or not Thanos' longtime paramour Lady Death can in fact die. As part of the evaluation, the Death of Death notes that in the Immortal Hulk, a green door swings open and death is irrelevant, and that in X-Men, a pod grows new life and death is without meaning. It's a wise observation that the recent trend in the best Marvel comics is to literally take death off the table, whether it's through Ewing and Joe Bennett's cosmically perpetual Hulk or the resurrection protocols of Krakoa detailed in House of X. There's also a meta observation here that superhero comics have so heartily exploited killing and reviving characters that the affair has lost meaning, which is a big part of why I like Immortal Hulk and X-Men's approach to death as a narrative device. It also sets up Jane Foster Valkyrie to make the case for death. In doing so, Jane determines a universe of living cells that didn't die but still reproduced. I'd call that a cancerverse, and I don't think I'd want to live there. I'm confident that's not an accidental turn of phrase, especially given Ewing's love of Marvel Cosmic, and it's also particularly relevant, of course, for Jane Foster, a cancer survivor at this point in Marvel, and it sets up the idea that the current trajectory of immortal Marvel has the makings of a well-intentioned cancerverse. There are perhaps concerning similarities when you remove death from the circle of life as it's meant to be. So bringing the Cancerverse into the cosmic portion of X-Men makes a strong amount of thematic sense, and no one in the world of mutants has closer ties to the Cancerverse than Vulcan. Given that Black Bolt escaped a many-angled one, it's not inconceivable to me that Vulcan might have actually been brought to the Cancerverse himself, instead of instantly escaping. I could see this resulting in anything from repressed memories of his time there, maybe hanging with the Revengers, to actually working as a stealth agent of the Cancerverse himself. In Realm of Kings, after all, Quasar is infected by the Cancerverse and operates undetected for some time. This is pure theory, but I'll also note that the Cancerverse has returned to Marvel very recently, in the pages of the Rushed Annihilation Scourge mini-event. After being led by an exiled sentry, the Cancerverse Vault now resides under the watchful eye of a seemingly less evil sentry in the Negative Zone. Speaking of the Negative Zone and the Death of Death, that's also where Hickman sent Johnny Storm to die in his Fantastic Four run, before revealing he was endlessly resurrected by Annihilus, but uh, for the time being, I digress. Another possibility for Vulcan's return is the use of the Phoenix in the aftermath of Avengers vs. X-Men, Marvel's 2012 event. The Phoenix Force is fragmented in, into five mutants during this time, the Phoenix Five, before ultimately being consolidated into Vulcan's brother Scott Summers. When Scott turns Dark Phoenix, the Phoenix Force is then taken by Hope Summers, who disperses the energy after re-establishing the mutant population on Earth uh, with the aid of the Scarlet Witch. That's a whole lot of Phoenix Summers combos and would mark some clean synergy with M-Day reviving Vulcan the first time and the opposite effects of M-Day reviving him a second time. It's a stretch, but this would also connect to Vulcan's newfound obsession with bombastic sayings about the fire deep within him. Plus, in Jason Aaron and Ed McGuinness' Avengers number 32, we've just seen the return of the Phoenix. Now, in this case, it's all about Namor bringing the Phoenix back to himself in a quest to defeat the Avengers and possibly then go on some sort of galactic killing spree that would maybe very much bring him in line with what he meant way back in House of X when he told Professor Rex, don't come to me until you really mean it. But nonetheless, we know the Phoenix is again in play in Marvel. A personal favorite alternate route relates to the original Sinister Secrets from Powers of Ten, while initially taken to mean the existence of more Summers Brothers. Is that Adam X, the Extremes music? I'm, known, I've, I'm theorizing now that this could mean an array of Gabriel Summers instead. As I've gone back into his origins, this actually begins to make more and more sense. In his origin, the Summers family parents are pregnant with Gabriel when they're captured by the Shi'ar and Emperor Dukan. Remember, Scott Summers and Alex Summers, his brothers, uh, they're safe by jumping out of the plane they were in. Although Dukan kills Scott, Alex, and Gabe's mom to punish Corsair for an escape attempt, he saves the baby and has him aged up to adolescence. Given the Shi'ar technology, that they can age up a child like this, and the fact that we know they have cloning tech readily available, it's used on Professor X at the end of the Brood Saga, for example, there could easily be a variety of Gabriel Summer clones running around. Maybe there's a version of the baby who aged in real time instead. The other way you could work in a narrative of multiple Vulcans is simply through the nature of the fault where timelines and realities bleed together. Likewise, the inclusion of countless realities opens all kinds of doors, from Apocalypse trying to get to his first horseman in the upcoming Ten of Swords to the lifelines of Moira X. Again, if you're bringing parallel realities and Vulcans from other timelines and places, there's, a, there's an endless possibility from all the Vulcans and Gabriel Summers type persons we could be talking about here that maybe made it through the fault. On a final note, I fully expect the Shi'ar to want a word with Vulcan. Zandra Naramani has to account with Vulcan 
basically killing her mother, Lalandra, and not to mention trying to kill her genetic father, Charles Xavier, by throwing him into the Amcon Crystal in Rise and Fall of the Shi'ar Empire. Plus, you've got Deathbird as a former love interest. If the Shi'ar are going to make a point of demanding a mutant for trial, a la Jean Grey in the Dark Phoenix Saga, Gabriel Summers would likely be first on the list. I could easily see this connection leading to a December event that is sort of a War of the Kings sequel, right? Except this time, you could potentially have the X-Men and their Krakoa alliance, um, you know, which is spacefaring and on the moon and, and now has a moon base um, on Chandelar in the Shi'ar Empire versus the Shi'ar, right? You could see all sorts of conflict arising from that, hopefully expanded beyond the traditional Shi'ar versus the X-Men narrative. Obviously, there's a lot to unpack here, and probably we'll get some good answers as soon as X-Men number 9 comes out. Plus, I have to admit the likelihood that Hickman's plans for this thread are unpredictably brand new are super high. That is <laughs> very, very likely as well. We could easily not be pulling from something that is known in Marvel Comics to date, and that's great too. Nonetheless, there's a lot of connective tissue here that has been very fun to explore, and whether any of it bears fruit in future Marvel comics, hopefully you now have some more fun stories and Marvel history in your back pocket as you dissect the mystery of Gabriel Summers yourself. Thanks, everybody, for listening, and as always, please leave comment, thoughts, opinions uh, as you have them here on the YouTube channel, or, of course, you can find me at Comic Book Herald anywhere online or over at www.comicbookherald.com. You can find links for all of the podcasts and content that I'm creating in the show notes as well. As a final note, thank you to our patrons, everybody over at patreon.com slash comicbookherald who help support the channel and the site. That is particularly helpful and, and very, very rewarding to see that. So thanks to everybody who does that and makes content like this possible. All right. In the meantime, thanks for listening, everybody, and enjoy the comics.